to your decision to, to resign late last year. It feels like that was a very important moment in green politics, but it must have been an enormously difficult decision for, for yourself. I think obviously for myself, it, it would have been a long and tortuous sort of journey where you know, even that year and a bit before, as I said, I, I was prepared to, to vote against my government on a confidence vote on fracking, and I said I would face the consequences. Thinking not just about electoral advantage, the immediate response to a by-election uh, that wasn't even about net zero. You know, ULES, the ultra-low emissions, who was about sort of pollution and reducing uh, nitrous oxide and, and PM at 2.5. Because it's so emblematic of demonstrating to other countries that we can you know, make this transition possible. Uh, and we're going to commit to that and show other countries how they can do it. We recognise then, using the evidence that the uh, UN Committee on Climate Change, the UK's Committee on Climate Change, the International Energy Authority, have almost said, you know, yes, we need oil and gas as part of the transition, and no one denies that, but we should not be in a position of opening new additional oil and gas facilities. Hi, I'm Chris Caldwell, and welcome to Season 3 of Conversations on Climate. So, um, Chris Gidmore, thank you so much for taking the time to come and speak to us on uh, Conversations on Climate. Now, in most of the episodes up until this point, uh, we've made some sort of, you know, introduction uh, about the kind of the background, um, history, career of the of the guest. Uh, but in, in your case, you're such a, you know, a high profile figure, all of that information is out there. And also you're someone who's on the verge of a of a big of, of a complete career transformation. So I uh, thought I instead of going down the usual path, I'd ask you um, if you could, could you summarize uh, sum up kind of um, Chris Gidmore in um, 2024 in three words? <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to, to join you uh, today. I think for myself, and I never like to talk about myself in a, in a third person, but uh, Chris Gibmore 2024, uh, I think is, is it definitely is a, a new chapter. I sort of feel that I now have a sort of independence and freedom to pursue uh, what now will be yeah, a single focus. Uh, so I think sort of focused, independent and free is probably the three words I'd, I'd use. You know, having been a member of parliament for 14 years, you have to cover all aspects of policy, from healthcare to defence to education to energy policy, uh, and now I just have this one uh, single focus on delivering net zero that I'm determined to make uh, the next chapter of my career. Um, so, going back to your your career as a, as an MP and a, and a minister, I spent you know, more than a decade in some of the, the highest um, you know, offices in the land. Um, could you tell us what um, achievements are you most proud of during your during your time in Westminster? So, but sadly, I didn't get the chance to be a minister for as, as long as I maybe hoped. But then, equally, yeah, I think sometimes when you become a member of Parliament and you you're elected and someone presents you with a a piece of paper saying this is what you're going to achieve do you want to sign all the dotted line i would have taken that uh back in 2010 and i had a great opportunity to work in the treasury in the department of health uh in the department of education and obviously the department of business uh, innovation and skills and as energy minister also science and research minister and i think for myself the proudest achievements the ones that obviously stand out was that opportunity to to sign net zero into law, to take the legislation uh, that meant that the UK became the first G7 country uh, to commit to net zero uh, is probably my greatest achievement. But I equally, I was very proud of some of the, the work I did on science, research and innovation. I secured the largest uplift in public spending on research and development, uh, I think in the last 40 years, uh, so that we were spending 12 billion pounds a year. It's now up towards about 20 billion pounds now and, and the aim is to spend 24 billion. I ran a big campaign called the road to 2.4% where I wanted to get a commitment that we would spend 2.4% of our GDP on research uh, and development. Uh, and also as universities minister, I was very proud of the international education strategy that I published, uh, which set out an ambition of getting 600,000 international students to come to the UK 
uh, by 2030. We actually just met that milestone uh, prematurely already uh, this year. So those are sort of three uh, key uh, achievements uh, in a career that um, I have no regrets uh, and was very uh, honoured and privileged to have that chance to, to serve in government. Well, fantastic. I just um, focusing on the the net zero uh, review for a moment. There were 129 recommendations that that, that came out of that. Um, so, so instead of kind of digging into into the detail there, uh, would it, would it be possible for you to kind of to sum up um, in a you know, a single sentence or two really the the meaning behind it and like the, the mindset that you you were you were trying to achieve from that review? So the review in a sentence was long-term programmatic commitment to deliver certainty, clarity, consistency, and continuity. If we can unlock uh, stability in, in policy making, we'll unlock a economic opportunity of this generation to bring in inward investment of up to a trillion pounds, nearly half a million new additional jobs. And it was really to set out that net zero is not a cost, you know, it is a once in a moment chance to demonstrate leadership and to change our economy uh, for the better. Um, and as someone who has been really at the heart of shaping climate climate policy, uh, would love to to kind of to dig in a little bit into the into the nuts and bolts there. So going back to your like when you when you started out in Westminster, um, and and compared to to the position today, could you tell us a little bit about how kind of awareness and attitude has changed over over that time, like within the the halls of power? So I think the interesting thing about this the last sort of decade and a half since sort of, yeah, I, I was elected in twenty ten is that we now know so much more and. The, the te and technologies have improved uh, so much rapidly um, that you know, we are we are running or to keep up, uh, and, and that's a real sort of challenge. And, and that's around information as well. So you know, when I first became a member of Parliament, you know, people were still campaigning you know, around issues of whether a coal mine should shut or not, or whether it's going to be a just transition, and obviously. There'd been a move away from coal towards gas, and and the UK was beginning to reduce its carbon emissions quite dramatically. But there was, you know, there was still sort of looking at fracking and various other things, and and obviously the Paris Agreement hadn't been signed as well, so there wasn't really that sort of framework. And I, and I'm personally sort of fascinated by this. As a, this is you know, one of the things I'm keen to maintain my interest in policy is how do you, how do you create these frameworks that and then change the world that then actually people. Um, look at the world in a different way. And I think net zero was that. You know, I you didn't know when I signed it into law that 90% of the world's GDP was going to now commit to net zero. And in a way, you know, the world in the past 15 years has moved from environmental issues and politics being the preserve of a, of a Green Party uh, or, or you know, sort of being seen outside of the mainstream, a nice thing to have in addition to obviously the economy and you know, making sure we have sort of well-paid jobs. And, uh, and now actually that environmental piece, that piece of that, whether it's focusing on nature-based solutions or whether it's focusing on decarbonizing industry is absolutely integral to the economy. So we've definitely seen this flip. And I sort of felt that myself that I wasn't that interested. Uh, yeah, I'm, le I'm late to this. I, I be honest and acknowledge this, that you know, when I first became a member of parliament, I'd focus on protecting the green belt, I'd focus on protecting uh, nature, but I, I didn't in my head see that as something that would be also integral to uh, the local economy or sort of bringing sort of jobs to my constituency. Uh, and equally, I saw energy as being about energy security, making sure the lights stayed on, that people could have cheap uh, sources of, of power. Uh, and I saw, you know, oh, maybe renewables are too costly, you know, it's, it, it was either or. And now it's not. It's 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 both and. While we're in a transition, but now it's gas that's more expensive, and and that's the real challenge now. Is that is, is, is everything's flipped on its head, uh, and and these issues that were once fringe issues are now front and centre of our future vision uh, and future economy of the UK. Which is why you know, I took the decision I did to leave Parliament because these issues aren't being treated with the seriousness that they deserve. 
Uh, being an MP is clearly an enormously challenging job with huge expectations from the public upon your shoulders to be on top of across so many different briefs and uh, so many different areas. In such a, a fast moving and complex um, environment as climate, are those expectations realistic? How much time does the average MP have to be on top of this brief as well of, uh, as all of the others? And considering yourself, it's it's you your journey into climate was one that happened over time. Do you think that people who are not directly involved in that brief within Westminster have the time, energy, access to expertise that's that's necessary to, for them to be able to make that type of um, the same journey as you have, the same sort of come to the same same conclusions as, as you have? One of the, the wonderful things about our democracy is MPs are drawn from every single walk of life. Uh, you know, there's no specific training uh, to be a member of Parliament, uh, and then we have teachers, we have lawyers, doctors, we have you know, people in the military who have academics sort of like myself, and that's fantastic. But it does create a challenge about how do you get a sort of uniformity uh, of knowledge uh, and information uh, across all members of Parliament. I would say that obviously campaign organisations play a really important role in holding MPs to account. I always say go back, go to the constituency, you know, run the constituency campaigns because that's how the MPs pick up uh, their attention. You know, their ears prick up if you start to talk about the, the relevance of your policy uh, initiative to the constituency and potentially that, you know, that's one way of, of, of getting an, an MP's attention quite quickly because they, that's the lens in which they, they, they look through politics. Um, Parliament's a bit like a theatre. So when you have these debates, when you have oral questions, which of you know, MPs ask ministers a question, it's quite stage managed. You know, you put in to ask a question, you have to write to the speaker to to, to request permission to to make a speech, um, and and all these uh, events are sort of have their own sort of scripted um, sort of material that is prepared for MPs. So. Um, both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party have their own uh, what's called parliamentary resources unit. So as an MP, you, you can be slightly worried you know, across all areas of, of, of policy that you're not necessarily going to get the party line correct. Uh, what, you know, and so what you do is you subscribe to this service which provides you with briefings uh, and that gives you a sort of template by which you can then sort of make your speech. Um, there's also the House of Commons Library, and that was one of the best things uh, about being a member of Parliament for me, was that the House of Commons Library, the, the research that they do, the research briefings, is absolutely first class. And you can go into, as a member of Parliament, you can request any sort of research to be done for you, and the library will provide that research. So, so there is a sort of strong base by which MPs you know, can access that level of, of, of quality that's needed. Whether they do or not, it's a separate matter. Uh, and that's the real challenge, is actually how do you make sure that MPs are aware of, of the, the knowledge they need to have? And that's a real challenge sometimes, because some MPs, it's always easy to fall back on anecdote, misinformation, disinformation. You know, Twitter has been, has corrupted and the, the, the parliamentary debate. I think somewhat people sort of will take tropes uh, and certain sort of statistics that are false and would propagate them even in the House of Commons. Uh, and that's a real challenge, I think, that, yeah, there are some organisations like DSMOG or uh, Energy and Climate Information Unit that are trying to address this. Um, but MPs are humans and are misled sometimes as well. Mm -hmm. And I imagine a lot of that gu guidance comes from the top. So if you have, say, Keir Starmer talking about um, climate positive uh, messaging on um, you know, well, whatever billions of commitments that he may he may now be turning back on uh, that may encourage um, people on the on the front end of, of of the Labour Party to be reading up on that uh, in that positive sense because that'll be what they're asked for. But if you have um, uh, Prime Minister Sunak uh, saying saying going on the, in the opposite direction, uh, that may encourage reading in the opposite direction. Would that be would that be? Be fair. Yeah, and I mean, one of the reasons why I'm glad I'm out of it now is that there's nothing worse, and you've seen it before. This will be excruciating, sort of U-turns or, or you know on, on the semantics where you know a politician said one thing, the leadership changes their mind, and then they're sort of forced into you know trying to contort themselves to, to try to sort of you know see what the new line is. Um, and I'm yeah, I'm done with that. Like I've been there, um, and obviously 
some people in politics you know, want to you know, play the game. They want to get to the top of the ladder. Uh, I sort of reached a point where, for me, the policy was more important than to that performative aspect. But you know, some people will you know, change the script and read out you know, whatever is given uh, to them. Uh, and I think that's where it's so important to try to frame the debate so that the, when it comes to the leaderships of, of, of respective political parties, they can see you know, that this is something that they can lead on and benefit from. I think there's a real challenge actually that's happened, it, it, again, like with social media, around aspects of polling and focus groups. I mean, there used to be just sort of two polls that were done, I think, the Ipsos, Mori and YouGov. And now there seems to be about sort of 15 or 16 polls that are running, you know, focusing on very sp- sort of specific issues. And I think that creates a, a corrosive environment in which to conduct politics, because politics should be about vision and leadership. Yes, you know, voters know what they want, but they don't necessarily know what they need in the future. And it's up to politicians to, to be um, signposts, as, as Tony Benn said, rather than weather vanes. And at the moment, just following the polling creates weather vane uh, policy, you know, where actually what we need is signpost policy of showing people the destination, showing people the promised land, uh, rather than following the polls. Because that might think, you know, be electorally advantageous to think you're doing the right thing. But sometimes you've got to stand up and, and, and be bold and be brave and also show people a future that doesn't exist and explain to them why that future is going to benefit them. And that's one of the challenges I think we face, you know, certainly in this general election year, is that people are afraid of their own shadow sometimes, thinking that if they, they commit to a policy, that somehow if it's going to cost them electorate, they'll withdraw from that, that support for that policy. Yeah, really interesting. Which kind of leads to to uh, kind of next kind of logical thought on that is, is really how government policy is produced. So, if we could, like, you know, draw it to a comparison between two areas, which obviously you'd be you'd be very familiar with. Uh, one is uh, your net zero report, um, and the other being uh, being being Rishi Sunak's um, rollback on um, green promises and uh, and you know, reissuing of, uh, of oil and gas licenses. Could you um, let us know what your process was? for writing your, your, your net, uh, net zero review, and then maybe compare that to the decision-making process of, uh, of uh, Prime Minister uh, Sunak um, that led him to, to, to his decisions. Um, and perhaps like was that was you know suggest whether that might have been led by collectively by the cabinet or you know by expert advisors, political advisors, or was it just simply you know a knee-jerk reaction to a by-election result? So when I took forward the net zero review, I was asked to to do this review, obviously on the back of the Conservative uh, leadership contest. Um, Liz Truss said she believed in net zero, but wanted to do it in a in a way that was proportionate, that was pro-business and pro-growth. So she rang me up and said, you know, did I want to come back into government? And I said that uh, actually, you know, I said who's going to be the Secretary of State. She said Jacob Rees-Mogg. And I said, said well, um, I'm not especially sort of keen uh, to be put in that position. And she said, well, how about I, you, you, you do an independent review instead uh, of net zero? I said, great, I'll, that, I'll take that. Um, and then I had an opportunity only for three months to, to, to set out um, you know, how we could do net zero in a way that was pro-business, pro-growth. Um, and obviously this trust you know, resigned uh, after that fracking vote. Um, I was expecting to be sacked because I refused to vote on that vote no confidence but then Rishi Sunak sort of came in they continued the review and in that three month process I know it was probably my last contribution uh, to public policy in, in this administration so I uh, yeah, threw everything at it and we had a fantastic team I assembled a, a, a group of civil servants I had complete autonomy from government it wasn't a government review it was an independent review uh, and I brought in a civil servant for every department and I said to them that I want this to be you know, something you're proud of as much as anything else. Uh, and, and so we, you know, we held 52 evidence roundtables. Uh, we received 1,800 written submissions. We went around the country in every devolved nation. Um, it was a large engagement exercise on net zero. And 
I think when we produced it, everyone was a bit shocked at both at the size and scale and scope of the review. But I, but I sort of saw it a bit like, you know, my model was the, the stirred review on the economics of climate change, that big, thick review. I thought, could I do an equivalent of the stern review for the implementation and delivery of uh, net zero and, and climate policy? And so that was my ambition. Now, in terms of, and we had a, I, I had a structure I worked to, so it was six pillars. It was net zero, uh, securing net zero was pillar one, net zero in the economy, uh, powering net zero, net zero in the community, net zero in the individual, and, and the future of net zero. And that was a very sort of, you know, tight structure by which we held the evidence uh, round tables. Uh, and then, you know, we had a plan for the report that was part one, setting out an overall narrative, a new narrative on net zero, and then part two was then using those pillars, those six pillars, to look at how we could do net zero uh, in a better way. Now, obviously, the report came out, the government, I think, welcomed back, took forward about 100 of the 129 recommendations. Uh, I also set out a mission-based approach. It was 10, 10 year missions, uh, which I similar to the Labour Party sort of position, actually. I'm taking a mission-orientated approach. I was very struck when I was science minister by Mariana Mazzucato's work on mission-orientated uh, policy. And, and I'd been involved in putting together the Horizon Europe regulations for the, the research and development programme in the EU while we were still in the EU. Again, having a mission-based approach that set out a sort of seven-year horizon for spending. And that really informed my thinking for, for net zero. How do we have a long-term commitment to delivering just in the same way the state's the Inflation Reduction Act, some of those tax credits are guaranteed to January uh, 2031. Or, or if you look at the EU Green Deal, again, 10 year sort of commitments in Germany, a 10 year hydrogen plan. Uh, and that's where I was trying to get to. Now, in contrast, if you look at the decision on the rollback on net zero, that's incredibly uh, short term. You know, thinking not just about electoral advantage, the immediate response to a by election. Uh, there wasn't even about net zero. You know, ULES, the ultra low emissions, who was about sort of pollution and reducing uh, nitrous oxide and, and PM at 2.5. Um, but that aside, uh, that was very short term thinking because in fact, delaying some of those measures, delaying, for instance, the, 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 the stopping the sale of petrol and diesel cars or delaying uh, sort of some of the measures around landlords and, and uh, insulation, uh, for the future, it's only going to cost people more, and that was the message that zero review. If you delay, yeah, all this stuff is going to become more expensive. It will just fall further behind in a net zero race with other countries like the states and Europe. Um, but ultimately, it, it, it's just bad economics, it's let alone bad policy. Uh, and so I you know, can, can contrast almost the sort of carefully prepared framework of the net zero review, thinking through difficult decisions, being honest with people with actually the sort of um, the sort of short-termism of, of the Prime Minister's announcement that it didn't get, undergo any uh, consultation. You know, the first I heard about it was when I was at New York Climate Week, and it did sort of, you know, there was no preparation. And, and this was in total contrast to, you know, the government's commitments of COP26, their net zero strategy they published then, which was, I think, you know, again, 700 pages um, which was a moratorium on oil and gas because we recognised then, using the evidence that the uh, UN Committee on Climate Change, the UK's Committee on Climate Change, the International Energy Authority, all said, you know, yes, we need oil and gas as part of the transition, and no one denies that, but we should not be in a position of opening new additional oil and gas facilities. And that's the line in the sands that was crossed here you know, and they tried to play a culture war, which was saying anyone who was against new additional licenses is against oil and gas. I'm not against oil and gas. The Net Zero Review talks about how we can transition oil and gas fairly and in a just way that isn't going to cost uh, our economy, isn't going to cost taxpayers, isn't going to create stranded jobs and assets like we did with the coal mines back in the 1980s. We'll have the equivalent of this when it comes to oil and gas in the future if we're not careful, because demand is dropping like a stone. If you looked at France, for instance, there was uh, figures just released yesterday that oil and gas has plummeted by 40% the use of oil and gas. And that's going to happen in the UK. So, so I think there's a real challenge here is that we've done this for short-term gain, but it will be long-term pain as a result. 
which then kind of brings us neatly to um, to your decision to to resign late last year. Uh, that must have been like it feels like that was a very important moment in green politics, but it must have been an enormously difficult decision for for yourself. The idea of should you be staying inside trying to influence, um, or are you better off making the the, the big statements uh, that draws a lot of attention to something, but with you know, with with serious like cost to yourself um, as, a, as a result of doing that. I, mind telling us, like, how did you, you come to that decision? Yeah, no, it, it is a really uh, important question. Um, and I think when I resigned, so obviously some people who maybe weren't focusing on the net zero debates and what I'd said in the past, or maybe it saw it as a shock resignation that it came out of the blue. I think obviously for myself, it, it, it would have been a long and tortuous sort of journey where... You know, even that year and a bit before, as I said, I, I was prepared to, to vote against my government on a confidence vote on fracking. And I said I would face the consequences. So even back in October 2022, I was about to lose the whip, the conservative whip, uh, for voting you know, on a confidence vote against you know, the government. Um, and then the net zero rollback sort of happened. You know, there were additional commitment to the new oil and gas licenses and i said this was the, what, they're going to be the, the the biggest mistake of rishi sunak's uh, premiership and i'd already then stood up in the house of commons and said i wouldn't vote for the king's speech uh, because of this oil and gas bill back in september uh, 2023 and that again is a conference vote uh so there have been a number of signals where i sort of said you know, voiced my uh disgust uh at, at the process of, 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 of rowing back on our climate commitments. And I wasn't prepared uh, to condone this. And for myself, I, I thought for long and hard about whether I should be an independent. You know, I, the, the challenge is, I think, you know, sort of, um, you know, I am a conservative with a small C. I believe in the power of markets. I believe uh, the business uh, is going to help solve the issues around net zero and climate change it won't be the state and and so you know, for that reason i was going to defect to another sort of party on on the left i am center right still um and i think that's you know really important that we have a center right vision of tackling climate change as well as obviously a center left vision as well we can't have climate policy simply being uh the preserve of one political party otherwise we'll never you know uh, achieve anything uh, it doesn't matter yet you know, which political party is in charge. Ultimately, we've all got a joint responsibility to reduce emissions, uh, carbon dioxide, no no political colours. Um, and so I thought about whether I'd be an independent, but then I'd just be one person. Um, and I'd been there before. I, I'd actually voted five times with the Labour Party on the energy bill. Didn't make a difference. I was one person. We didn't really cover it. Yeah, it wasn't. It didn't have any impact. There was no significant sense of actually doing this was going to shift the dial. And I thought ultimately, I had sort of thirteen years before introduced a piece of legislation which said if you change your political party, or if you decide to resign your party membership, you should allow your constituents to choose again their MP because ultimately they, they voted me in as a conservative. So. I'd already separately committed uh, in the past to saying that there should be an automatic uh, by-election if there was a change of political affiliation. And I still believe that. So on that principle, on that separate principle, I resigned my seat as well as resigning the Conservative uh, whip. Uh, but I also felt yeah, it was important to try to give that sense of a, of a reset. I wasn't going to allow people to get away with saying that somehow that Uxbridge by-election was advantageous, you know, or, or moved the policy debate in a particular direction away from net zero. I needed to show that there were other con every, there was a reaction to every action. So the Kingswood by election obviously was caused, you know, as a climate election, as a net zero election, you know, to demonstrate there are consequences electorally if you ignore the importance of climate change. Um so the the resignation was a the biggest way that you could make an impact um, in your your remain because you, you already decided to to not to not stand again. So this was the moment where you found an issue 
that was the the straw that broke the camel's back. It was the, it was the, the 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 one that you just you couldn't move move past, and um, the resignation given you had a shorter amount of time 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 left. It was a very powerful way of reframing the narrative from the you know Ulez, um, Ox, 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 Oxbridge, and getting the conversation going in a different direction. Is that is that, would that be fair? Yeah, and I think also. I felt a great weight of responsibility as the energy minister who, who was responsible for net zero, uh, as someone who took forward you know, the largest engagement exercise on net zero with the Mission Zero report, um, that there was a weight on my shoulders to, to demonstrate an integrity around what net zero means in terms of a commitment that you make a contract uh, for the future. And I'm not thinking about this in terms of the present. I don't. It's, we'll, we'll look back in five years' time, and and you know, twenty twenty four, all these. Yeah, and I've seen this in the past. I look back in twenty fourteen and think, what was I voting on? And actually, now I'm voting. I was voting last year on, on actually uh, removing legislation that I voted on in the past. And so, there's a point actually where I'm thinking longer term around you know, that we should have a marker in the sand which says that new oil and gas licenses. We need to set an end date for the future production of oil and gas in the UK. We have the ability to show the rest of the world it can be done. Um, and for me to continue, you know, yes, I could have voted against the bill, um, but then I would have still have been in the same party that was introducing this bill. And you know, people were saying to me, well, you know, how, can, how can you look yourself in the mirror and, and still maintain support for net zero and also belong to a party that is so blatantly going against you know, the policies that are needed that have been set out by the UN that go against the Paris Agreement, that go against the IEA, and and I just couldn't do it. And I think for me, it was obviously deeply uncomfortable. And I, and I, I, I trust me, I sort of felt sick, you know, for for weeks before, because I knew that the bill was coming at the end of December. So my whole Christmas was spent every single day, you know, sleepless nights thinking, should I do this? Is this being, you know, self indulgent? Am I abandoning an opportunity, a platform? And in the end, I thought, actually, that this is the one chance I potentially have to, to, to you know, because I, I knew that there'll be, be election later on the year, but this will be a moment by which I could demonstrate that it this is so important um, that it could raise the salience of the issue. And it has been sort of spoken about, you know, whether people are against my decision or for my decision, it doesn't really matter because it's still that we've been talking about this issue. And we'll continue to talk about it. And one day, you know, in maybe 10 years' time, in maybe 15 years' time, people will look back and say, can't believe it took, you know, an MP had to resign over this issue, an issue that was so obvious that was coming down the tracks when everyone was, you know, wittering on about culture wars and, and, and various minutiae at a time where we had serious, big, strategic decisions to be made and we failed to take I can dig into that a little, a little further. Like the Conservative Party has clearly been um, a very important part of your life for an awful lot of years, um, and your resignation was you know, loudly, loudly lauded by, uh, by like across the um, across your your allies on on the the greener side of um, of politics, but it was um, very enthusiastically criticized by the by by the, the the conservative party how did it feel to be like a conscientious objector within a party that's been so important to you for for, for so many years i like that phrase i hadn't thought about that uh, before um when i got involved with the conservative party um it was i've I'd, I'd been a member for quite some time um but it was 2005 december 2005 that i actually thought I want to get involved and, and 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 try to be involved in policy and I didn't know how to but then it was David Cameron had just become leader and I sort of felt for the first time that there was potentially a a, a leadership that was going to think about how to face the future and think about you know, what do we need in Britain in the 21st century and, uh, and I applied for the sort of policy task force the public services policy task force I wrote that report uh, for the Conservative Party, and then I ended up working as the Conservative Party's education advisor, devising their sort of free schools policy, moving all schools to become academies also. Uh, and that felt like a moment in time where the Conservative Party understood that you need to change to stay the same. You can't look backwards and think that we can 
turn the clock back. Um, and and it, it and I was part of that. I felt part of a movement. Um, and then I became a member of Parliament. It was slightly unexpected. I won my seat in Kings, but it was my home seat. I didn't expect to win. I don't know if you ever watched the sort of the candidate, the Robert Redford movie, where he then turned. This is what I do now. It was a bit like that. Sort of uh, when I got elected, I was only twenty eight when I got elected. Um, and uh, you know, I, I I felt at the time that we were we had we were gripping these issues around reform uh, of various services that needed to happen. And and slowly, I've seen the party move, particularly since twenty nineteen, um, towards a more social conservatism towards sort of hectoring and telling people what they can't, shouldn't do. Uh, and ultimately, I'm a conservative because I believe that people should, you know, it's your life. It, you, you should be able to, within reason, live the life you want to live. Uh, and that was every, always in my, you know, as a liberal conservative, you know, I'm a believer in liberal economics, but also liberal social policy. And, and now we've seen a sort of change now that sort of, you know, spends a lot of time, and, and it backfires because ultimately... Yeah, if you start sort of focusing your attention on, on what you stand, what, what you're against, people don't know what you stand for. Uh, and, and for me, I've left the Conservative Party, but at the moment, the current iteration of the Conservative Party is not the Conservative Party that I became a member of Parliament in. Uh, and I think you can see a number of the difficulties it's facing um, because some of the members of Parliament, um, I, I simply wouldn't recognise uh, back in 2010 as being conservatives, they would have been a new clip. Thank you very much for joining us for part one of this fascinating interview with Chris Skidmore. Part two will be coming very soon. I hope you can join us again. These are conversations that you just can't afford to miss.